For over 140 years, the walls of Jerusalem lay in ruins. Even though many believed the walls could never be rebuilt, God raised up one man, Nehemiah, who believed they could. So God transformed an ordinary cupbearer into an extraordinary leader who changed the world. This week, discover the leader in you. We are in a new series, and this particular series is called Change Your World in 52 Days. Change Your World in 52 Days. And what this all stems from is the story of Nehemiah, where God called him to come and change his world, and he gave him the things for that, and we're going to talk about that. But before we begin, I'd like for us to open up with prayer. Hallelujah, Lord God. Again, I love being with your people, Lord. We love being with you and that you're with us. We ask God today that our understanding would be alert. We would be alert. Our spirits would be open to what you want to do because you've called your church to make a difference in Rochester, Indiana. You call your church to make a difference in this world. So God, I pray that our hearts would grasp this and it would be uh, taught plainly and understandable in Jesus' mighty name. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to read to you, and this comes from Nehemiah, and I'm just going to read to you the first four verses, and Nehemiah, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it after I read it. It says, in a month at Keslev, on the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And Nehemiah said, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before God, before the God of heaven. Hallelujah. So what this is, last week we talked about embracing a burden. Listen. God gives burdens to his people. And when I say burdens, something that weighs heavy upon you, something that just says, something's got to change. Something's got to be done about this. I don't like the way things are happening right now. I don't like the way things are in this particular area. I hate it when kids are being abused. I hate it when women are being abused. I hate it when this racial thing, you know, it goes on and on and on. And all of a sudden, you have this particular thing in your heart over one particular thing, and it just weighs you down. And it's a burden. God's given his church burden so that we will move and do something about it. Now, many people, they throw that burden off. They don't want anything to do with it. But God says, I want to give you a burden. And I want to give every single one of you people a burden. And listen, why is that? Because the burden will cause us to go outside here and make a difference in our world. It will. I've always said this, and I'll say it again, again. When you're sleeping and you're sleeping on one side, you will never turn over to the other side until all of a sudden you're hurting on one side. When you're hurting, then you'll roll over. Otherwise, you'll just stay in that position all night long. And why not? It's very comfortable. But that's why we roll around because of the uncomfort. So God, sometimes he gives his people burdens to do that. God wants his church to care about things outside of themselves. Amen? God designed us to affect our world around us. We're designed to make a difference in the world around us. Not just flow with it. We're to be a difference. That's why you see that fish emblem that's supposed to go against the flow. We're supposed to make a difference. We're supposed to affect the world in a positive way, not a negative way. So many times in the past, some churches have really affected the world in a very negative way. And they cling to that church. They cling to that and they hold it and they, and they use it and they throw that in your face again and again and again. But God says, I want you to make an effect in this world in a powerful, positive way in people's lives. The way they talk, and their habits, and their home, and their family. I want you to make a difference. We are the difference in this world. And the world's going to change. It's through the church, and that's it. Amen? If the world's going to change for the better, it's through the church, and that is it. All right. God does this by giving us his burden. And God gave Nehemiah a burden. And he gave him a burden for the people in Jerusalem, the remnant that came back from exile. And they were there. And they were there for a long, long time. And every time, they were actually given, if you read, actually, I was in my reading. I thought, oh, my goodness, this is, lines right up with my reading, Bible reading. But in Ezra, it talks about the Persian king there where he gave gold, he gave silver, and he gave back all the utensils of the, of the temple of God. He gave it back to the Jews. He says, now, go back to your land. 
Go back to your land and build your temple. And they got excited, and thousands of them went. They went back to uh, the Jerusalem to rebuild it. And when they got there, they started the building. And what happened? The world came against them. The lies, the accusations, uh, the, the letters they would send off to the king. Hey, they're just getting ready to rebel against you, O king. You better watch it. You better stop them. And, and he, they just kept, and they, they hindered them from building the temple the way they wanted it, and they hindered them from building the walls. So here's all these people for years and years and years back at Jerusalem. No walls for protection. No, uh, you, can, can you imagine if all America was burned down, all America had all the flags of all the other nations and how you would feel shame for America and how you feel sorrow for America. That's how they felt. They felt that way. And then also there was no protection. And so God says, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to send a man who's going to make a difference in the world in which he lives. We look at the kind of person that God wants to use, and this is what we found out last week. This is the kind of person that God wants to use, a person that, who will sit down and cry, a person who will kneel down and pray, and then a person who will stand up and act. These are all the things that God called Nehemiah to do, and Nehemiah did those things. First of all, Nehemiah sat down when he heard the news. He sat down and he wept. I mean, when you, when you, you can stand there and cry, but when you sit down, you just don't have the strength anymore. You sit there and you just sob and you cry. God gave him a really heavy burden, and it really affected him. It wasn't one of those worked up ones, but it's just like, no, this shouldn't be. This should have been taken care of a long time ago, God. These are your people, God. You, you're a great God, and look at your people, how they are. Why, God? And mourned over it. When God puts a burden on your heart, don't try to escape it. Because if you try to escape it, listen to me, you're probably going to escape a blessing that God wants to do also. It's amazing how God takes uh, bad things and he turns it for a blessing and he turns it for a blessing not only for you, but for those around you as well. God wants to bless the world and he'll do it through giving us a burden. The second thing that Nehemiah did, he knelt down to pray and he sought the Lord. The Bible says he did that for a long time. He fasted and prayed. He fasted and prayed. Somebody's got to do something, he says. It might as well be me. God, give me the plan as what to do. God, help me to know what to do. He sought God because this was much bigger than Nehemiah's abilities. So he sought a big God who can answer the pr uh, prayer there. So if you are experiencing great affliction right now, or if you're about to undertake a, a really big project thing, guys, Kneel down and pray, amen? <laughs> Kneel down and pray. Don't wait till something's like, oh, it's bad. What do I do now? I'll go to God. Help me, God. Help me, God. No, kneel down and pray beforehand, and you'll make less mistakes, amen? And that's exactly what Nehemiah did. And then, after he did all that, he stopped praying for a moment to stand up and act out. And there's, this is what he did. He said, somebody's got to do something. It might as well be me. Prayer is not... This is a neat saying I came across. I, want to, I don't know who the author is, but it says this. Prayer is not getting man's will done on, in heaven, but it's getting God's will done here on earth. Prayer is not getting man's will done in heaven. Lord, do this for me. Prayer is to change the things down here on earth. Prayer is getting God's will on earth. God has a will for this earth. God has a will for your neighborhood. God has a will for your family. God has a will for this church. God has a will for Rochester and your towns and your neighbors. He has a will for it. That's why we need to pray to get God's will so that we can act upon God's will. For God's will to be done on earth, what does he need? He needs you. He needs me. He needs his people. He needs his children, what we learned about today. God needs the church in order for his will to happen here on earth. Isn't that amazing? If the church does nothing, God's will does not happen. That's kind of, you know, seriously, think about it. And that's the reason why things are bad in situations because the church has stopped doing and stopped praying for God's will in that area. God uses very ordinary people. He used a cupbearer. What is a cupbearer? He's a guy who tasted the wine to make sure it wasn't poisonous and so that the king can continue drinking it. That was his job. And he was an ordinary guy. And God used him. He wasn't, when God sent him to Jerusalem, he was not a contractor, church. God sent him to build a wall. Are you a contractor? No. Hmm. All right, go ahead and build that wall. How many of you guys would hire a contractor to build a wall or a house for you? Right? Would hire someone who's never done it before, hire them to build your house right now? It's going to say, otherwise, I'll do it for you. <laughs> I charge quite a bit, but I'll still do it for you. Yeah, you're smart. You wouldn't do that. But there's something that God does. He uses ordinary 
people who lack things. Why? So that his glory can shine through. So that he will receive the praise. Wow, sure God is good if he can do that. If he could do that. So he wasn't a building contractor. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a prophet. He was a simple cupbearer. And and what he did, he built a wall around that city in a miracle 52 days. Over 40 years, they couldn't even build the temple. 40 years. And he built a wall around the whole city and, and the gates in 52 days. That is a miracle. That is a miracle. And they knew it couldn't be him because he had no skills in that. So I had to give glory to God. So this is my point today. Ordinary Joes, ordinary Susans. I, I don't know what they call the women. But anyway, ordinary uh, Joes and Susans. Uh, who hap- God uses those who happen to care more, not about all the things that you have. So listen to this. The devil will disqualify you when you feel like you don't have what it takes to do it. That is the devil disqualifying you. God says, greater am I in you than he is in the world. I will do great things through you if you would trust me in this area. Church, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to me. I'm talking to every one of us. God wants to use you ordinary people. All you beautiful, smart, intelligent, athletic people, he'll still use you. But all the rest of us, he wants to use in a mighty way. I don't care how young you are or how old you are. God wants to use you. And right now, listen, what does he want to use you for? He wants to use you to bring his kingdom here around you where you live. That's what God wants. Every one of us. Hallelujah. Can we say, thank you, Lord? Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Today, I want to help, with the help of God, I want us to, uh, I want to inspire you and I want to equip you and I want to empower you to see yourselves as world-changing leaders. Say leaders. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I struggle with this. You can ask my wife, oh, leaders. I'm a lousy leader, Lord God. <laughs> Help me, Lord God. So anyway, this, this sermon was preached to Terry Baldwin and still being preached to Terry Baldwin today, OK? Here's a, let's look at three thoughts from Nehemiah. Uh, he was a world-changing leader. Number one, there's three things that God used, how God used Nehemiah as a leader. Number one, a change of world leader defines his mission clearly. You want to change the world? You got to define your mission. What is it that you're going to do? And you have to define it very clearly and very concise and very narrow. Amen? Here's, let me give you an example. And in Nehemiah 2, verses 4 through 5, says this. And the king said to me, what is it that you want, Nehemiah? Then I prayed to God of heaven, and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, please let me, send me to the city of Judah, where my ancestors are buried. Now watch. Right here is a simple statement. It's very simple. So that I, say it with me, can rebuild it. So that I can rebuild it. That, that was his it. This is my whole plan, king. I want to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. That's my plan. I mean, he, didn't, he could have done a thousand other things. I want to go there and take care of all the corruption. I want to get rid of all those leaders who are corrupting and doing things wrong and stealing. I want to make the, uh, the wrong right. I want to build the, t- I want to do all these other things. He could have done a thousand other things, but he made it very simple. I want to rebuild the wall. I want to rebuild it. And that was as simple as that. Very simple. Your burden, your burden. Say, uh, here's what I want to help you do today. The homework was for you to pray for God to give you a burden last week. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand about that today, but the Lord's been working on me and my burden. You know, say, I don't have a burden, Pastor Terry. Hey, God has a burden waiting for you. Pray for it. Pray for it. Lord, what is it that you want to do in the city around me? What is it that you want to do in my neighborhood? What is it that you want to do with me? You ever always heard people say, what's my purpose in life? You guys ever hear people talk like that? God has a purpose for every one of us, and some of us has multiple purposes as well. But say, God, give me a burden. And I guarantee you, after a while, God's going to give you a burden. Your eyes are going to be open to situations, and all of a sudden, your heart's going to be heavy for it. You say, you know what? Nothing's being done about this over here. Why isn't something being done about this over here? It might as well be me. It might as well be me. So what is God calling you to do? Take something broad, and what you need to do is narrow it down. Let me give you three examples real quick. Uh, For instance, uh, maybe your example for 2017. I want to lead my family into being out of debt by the year 2017, except for my home. Every other thing, every other bill, I want to lead lead my family how to be out of debt. Very simple. And even with a date on it, even with a time frame, 
That's very simple. It's very narrow. It's not this vague thing that's out there. You can, a 12-year-old could say, I can understand what you're saying there, and I can follow what you're saying right there. How about this one? Before I graduate high school, before I graduate high school, I want to lead uh, those on my soccer team to the Lord Jesus Christ. Or I, at least I want to witness to every single one on my soccer team and tell them about Jesus Christ. That's a very doable thing. Amen? I mean, it's very concise, and it's right there. It's not hard to follow. Or this one. I want to give every child who's seven years old, I want to give them a picture Bible who lives in Fulton County. I want to make sure every seven-year-old in Fulton County, look, look how narrow that is, right down to the age, right down to the children and stuff, and exactly what it is you want to give them, and exactly what area are we talking about here. It's not the whole world. It's not India. It's, just, it's right now, I just want to give every seven-year-old in Fulton County a picture Bible. Very simple, very concise, easy to follow. God's going to give us a burden. God's going to give every one of us a burden, and he wants us to find that narrow thing as how to see it done. What is it that God wants to do? Can we put it in one sentence? Amen? Can you do it? If, the key is, if you can define it, you can do it. But if you can't define it, you can't do it. You won't do it. So we've got to define what is it that God wants us to do. Listen, some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about today, <laughs> it's not groundbreaking. It's not one of these like, uh, wow, that was deep. You know? <laughs> it's just one of these practical things. How many of you guys know that God can be very practical in life? Amen? So many times you have, you guys ever heard that saying, oh, they're so spiritually minded, they're no earthly good? Okay, lots of times I think people abuse that saying, and they never want to be spiritually minded. But the thing is this, there are those who just say, you know, Lord, it's got to be this, it's got to be that. Here's the burden I have for you, and it's for people. And to meet people's needs, you're going to need me, and you're also going to need some practicality to it. Amen. All right. Okay. For instance, some of you may say, don't, don't be vague like this. Say, I want to help the poor. <laughs> say, the poor? Uh, what poor? Uh, what, what kind of poor? What is it that you want to do to them? Or where, how do you want to help them? You know? Maybe you could say, well, I want to narrow it down. I want to help the poor. I want to help those create a budget who's never had a budget before and help them to follow it. That would help the poor. And that's very concise. That's one point is how you can help the poor. Because you can help the poor in thousands of ways. Am I right? So God wants us to be very narrow and concise. Number two out of three. A change of world leader makes plans carefully. Makes plans carefully. They don't just run out there and hop on a horse and run every different direction. They, they make plans what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, how they're going to do it. Now, I understand that some of this stuff may come across like, oh my goodness, this, that's overwhelming. I don't know what to do. I'm frozen. I'm right here at the beginning, and I don't know where, how to get out of the gate. What do I do in this particular situation? We've already got the what. We already got the what. God told us what we want us to do. We, uh, I'm going to use that one thing about the, the children. Uh, give this, every seven-year-old a picture Bible that lives in Fulton County. We've already got the what. Now we need the how. And that's where the planning comes in, the how. See, if you don't plan to do something, you're planning to lose. You're planning to fail. How does that go? Oh, you plan to build. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Let's say that with her. Ready? Ready to go. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. He wants us to plan how to do things. Watch what, how Nehemiah does it. He has detailed out a very specific plan to rebuild the walls. He says, the king asked him, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. So the king says, hey, I'm going to send you up. You know what? That sounds like a good idea. When do you want to do it and how long is it going to take? See, listen, Nehemiah didn't just make this stuff up on the spot. I want you to know this. When God gave him the burden, it was like in November, it was, it was late. It was like early winter or late fall. And it wasn't until spring that he actually st stood before the king, and then the king asked him all about it. So he had all this time that he'd been planning, all this time that he'd been praying. He didn't just go and just make stuff up on the spot. You, ever, you guys ever watch the Shark Tank that show is awesome. <laughs> uh, I love the bald dude. He's my hero. Anyway, but the thing is, yeah, not because he's bald. Okay, anyway, <laughs> chumps. Uh, but I love it when some of these people sometimes come in there and they, they really don't have a plan. They're just hoping, give me money and I'll make it work. You know, that's exactly what they do. And so they say, no, you don't have a plan. Get out of here. You're wasting my time. God wants us to have plans as well. 
Here's what Nehemiah did. <coughs> Watch how Nehemiah makes two specific requests for the king. In Nehemiah 2.7, it says this. If it pleases the king, may I have the letters to the governors of the trans uh, Euphrates so they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? That's the first thing he asked for. Look, I need a letter so that I can have safe travel because there's people out there who do not want me to accomplish what I'm going to do. And I want them to see that, hey, I'm doing this with the king's approval. Second thing, he says this, and may I have a letter to Asaph, a keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. Nehemiah, now check this out. Nehemiah found Asaph's name and what he did. I mean, back then they didn't have Google, church. <laughs> okay, who has the royal, uh, taking care of the royal lumber and all that kind of stuff? He didn't have that. So then, here's a guy who had to do some research, had to do some studying, had to find a name, had to find out where, he, where he's at, where he, where he rules, where he's doing his business and all that kind of stuff. And, he, and then he told the king, he says, this is, I know what I need. I know I need some timber, and I know I need the rubble that's there in the rocks, so we'll build it back up. And so where am I going to get the timber? So he's planning all the stuff step by step and what to do. You know what? Um, like I said, Christians sometimes tend to think planning process is not very spiritual. You know, they, they, some, I, I, this, this, there's some Christians who say planning is not very spiritual. I'm just going to trust God and he's going to supply all my needs. Yes, God does do that stuff. But do you know what the needs that you have to have are? Do you know what to pray for? Yeah, that takes some planning. You know, to say that you don't need planning is a very dumb idea. It's not a very good idea. And, and also, I'm going to skip over this next part, but we need that. We need to make plans carefully. Let me give you an example. Say God wants me to help people or set people free from addictions. God wants to use, God has given you a burden to set people free from all kinds of addictions, be it alcohol, be it uh, drugs, be it whatever kind of addiction you're talking about. God does not like to see people trapped up in chains. So he wants to send you to set them free. So what do you need to do? First of all, you need to pray about it. You have the burden, now you need to pray about it. Say, Lord, give me wisdom. And oh, the whole time you're making plans, keep praying, Lord. Open my eyes, give me understanding how I can go through this. And so what you'll do then, you'll, you'll look at it and you'll say, my goodness, this is big. How can I... How can I see all these people set free? Which, which one should I go after? Should I just go after uh, uh, the ones with the alcohol or the ones with drugs, the ones with the porn addiction, the ones with uh, whatever it may be, substance abuse? How, which one should I pick? You know, it kind of overwhelms you, that sort of thing. What, what do I do next? Where, where do I even start? Well, I want to give you this. Don't put the whole big project on the table at once, okay? Don't put the whole big project on your to-do list right away. What you need to do, you need, it'll freeze you up. What you need to do is define the very next step in the process. You need baby steps. How many of you guys ever heard, who's ever seen that movie, um, uh, What About Bob? Baby steps? All right, for those who haven't, I'm going to show you the video real quick. Baby steps? It means setting small, reasonable goals for yourself one day at a time one tiny step at a time baby steps for instance um when you leave this office don't think about everything you have to do in order to get out of the building just think of what you must do to get out of this room and when you get to the hall deal with that hall and so forth you see baby steps baby steps oh boy Baby steps, baby steps, baby steps through the office, baby steps out the door, it works, it works, all I have to do is take one little step at a time and I can do anything. Mm. Baby step around the office. <laughs> baby step around the office. I like that. All I have to do is a baby step at a time, and I could do anything. I could do anything. Let me give you that example again about the addiction. What, what kind of baby steps should we do? Let me give you a quick example. First of all, find out, is there anyone else who's doing this particular thing right now in the city or maybe some other city? Is there another place where they're taking care of addictions and they're helping people setting them free through the power of Jesus Christ and, and other means as well? You find that. 
Then the next thing what you need to do is you need to call them up and ask them, can I make an appointment with you? The next baby step, can I call you up and talk to you about this? I, we're looking to do this and I, I need some advice. I need some wisdom in this. Third thing you need to do, you need to write down all the questions that you know you're going to be asking them. Be prepared when you go into this meeting. Don't just show up and say, teach me. Go in with the questions. Say, well, how do I go about this? What do I do about that? Where, where should I go for this? And, and do I need this? And what did you do in this situation? See, the baby steps. And then the very next baby step is go and meet with the person and have the interview. Amen? <laughs> See, these are small increments. And it's a baby step. It's the next step, the next step, the next step, the next step. You don't take the whole thing at once. You've heard the saying, you can't eat an elephant with one bite. You have to do it one bite at a time, right? You do it little by little by little. And with the baby steps, you just make these simple things. It may seem ridiculous. Say, well, I want to skip three of them. No. Just stick with one or two or three and just, just stick with the one and just keep going one at a time and pray the whole time and God will lead you in those areas. Amen? He'll even bring people into your path that you realize, I didn't know about you. How did you where'd you come about? And the next thing is go home. Take that information and process it. Think it through. Write some other things down. See, these are baby steps that God wants us to do in order to accomplish the things that he's given us a burden for. Amen? Listen, again, if we do not plan, we will fail. You will fail. Some of you today, I'm, maybe God has already given you your burden. You already know what it is that God wants you to do. Make the next step. Plan. Plan. Dream about it. Think about it. Let it stew. Keep it going. Keep it going. Seek God. Seek God. You know what? That's going to just inspire you. That's just going to build excitement inside of you as well. Hallelujah. You don't change the world all at once. You change, it, you change it by being faithful one step at a time. Amen? Hallelujah. A world changer makes plans. Nehemiah, and this is my third point. Nehemiah makes, he's getting ready. He has all the information. He already has the burden. Excuse me. He already has the burden. And uh, then he's also, let's see here. I'm forgetting something. I want to make sure I don't forget something. Okay. He already has a burden which God has given him. He's already defined what it is that I have to do. And he's already been making plans for a very long time. Now, what does he have to do? Now he goes and he travels over a thousand miles away from where he was. And he travels a thousand miles away to this place. And when he got there, uh, he spent the night and he rested. And early the next morning, he got up before anybody else. And he was by himself. He didn't let anyone know what he, what he was there for. And he got up, and he looked out, and he spied the whole land. He walked the whole walls. He saw where the, the most work needed to be done. He saw where there's rock, piles of rock and rubble that he could reuse and all that kind of stuff. He, he surveyed the situation. And then he comes back, and he talks to them, and he gives a plan to them. Um, so a change of will leader defines the mission clearly. And number two, he makes a plan and makes plans carefully. And in number three, he inspires people passionately. Inspires people passionately. Listen, you can make a difference. All of us can make a difference by ourselves. But if you want to be a world changer, you need other people. Amen. If you want to be a world changer, you want to do something great, you need other people. And that's where God says, hey, I have this whole family here that you could pull from. You could do great things with as well. You can make a difference by yourself, but you need other people. Nehemiah, here's what happened to him. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because of yet I have said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then Nehemiah 2.17 says this. Then I said to them, now, now he's, he's surveyed the place. Now he's going back and he's talking to him. You see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem, it lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come on, let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God and on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, yeah, you know, I see God is in this. I see your plan. It's very doable. It's, I understand it. It's a great idea. And yes, we understand the situation. Let's do it. They said, let us start building. So they began to do the good work. See, Nehemiah, he went. He had everything all in order. And then when he went and talked to them, that burning inside of him, that burden, caused him to just be excited about what he's getting ready to do. And he saw what God wanted him to do. And so now when he talked to them, I imagine when he talked to them, he gave it passionately. He didn't just say, so uh, what do you guys think? You want to 
Want to build a wall? <laughs> you want to build a wall? You want to do that? I don't know. What do you think? You want to build? He didn't take any surveys. He didn't take any votes on the situation. He says, God has sent me here. We're going to build this wall. And not only that, God's hand is in us because the king has sent me. And the king has given us these letters. And nothing's going to stop us. We're going to have trouble. We're going to have people who are going to persecute us. We're going to have people who are going to be attacking us. And there's going to be times we're probably going to have to build this wall with one sword in our hands and looking over our shoulders and having people watching us while we build this wall. There's going to be issues. Listen, here's one another thing. I, if you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ to after listening to this smooth. message, that is or if you have any questions have concerning our ministry here at Faith Jesus Health Christ Center, Earth, we would like to hear die from you. Sins, but what the devil tried Please to do, he tried contact to kill them right us through our website at he tried to kill him, www. So they had to run to Egypt. They had to run away. And so uh, or you same, can call other times, Jesus said, uh, he's talking to the people, and the people get all riled, and they want to stone him. They take him to the edge of the cliff, ready to push him off. I mean, he encountered some issues. He encountered people pushing back on this him. He knew Roger what his situation, saying, he knew what he was here God to do. Bless. He knew what he was here to do. But he had all this pushback. He had people trying to kill him. He had people trying to put, he had demons attacking him through people. He had storms attacking him while he was on the boat. He, all this stuff was against Jesus Christ. It was not easy for him to accomplish what God had called him to do. But yet, he saw it. He knew exactly what it was. It was simple and narrow. He had planned on it. He knew what he had to do, what all he had to go through, and he was going to accomplish it. Paul, let me give you another example. You guys remember Paul? This is a guy that God told him to do some great things, to go out and preach. I mean, this is a guy who had been beaten several times beyond measure on the back. He'd been whipped several times. This is a guy who'd been in shipwrecks, and the snakes are biting him. Everything's against Paul, you know what I'm saying? Everybody's against Paul. And all the stuff, they left him for dead at one time. But you know what? Th those are difficult times. But yet he realized... This is what I'm called to do. I'm called to the Gentiles. I'm called to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's just that simple. And I'm going to do it. And he inspired other people with him as well. And they saw the hand of God in him. Hallelujah. So they said, hey, let's do it. Nehemiah gave them the burden. He wept, he prayed, and then he planned. And then he inspired all these other people. And he spoke with passion. You know, there's a saying, I, I forget who said it, but John Wesley, he said this, light yourself on fire with passion and people will come from miles around just to watch you burn. When you see someone who's excited about something, you, it just kind of draw, draws your attention to them. You just watch them saying, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what happened to me. That's exactly this particular missionary. I saw him. He was on fire. I mean, this guy was on fire. This, this guy was like, oh my goodness, you can't contain the fire. It was just, and I watched him. I thought, dear God, that's, I, that's exactly what I'm hungering for. That's what I want. I can get behind. And that's the whole reason why I wanted to become a missionary, because I saw this. He inspired me. Have you ever seen someone just inspired you because of all the passion that's inside of them? That's what God wants to do. He'll give you a burden, and you need to pray about it. And then you need to see exactly what it is that he's called you to do. Put it in one sentence. And then you plan for it. And then you go out and do it. And I'll tell you what, the whole time you're planning for it, the whole time you're praying, it's just rolling around in you, growing and growing and growing. And then you'll talk to people, and people will say, my goodness, I want to do that. That sounds like a great thing to do. Listen, church, that's you. I'm not talking about people up here on, on the stage. I'm talking about you and I outside. The, God is going to give you a burden. This is what you and I need to do. Are you going to do it, or are you just going to live for yourself? Everything that we live for on ourselves here on this earth and not living for anybody else, it's all going to perish and it's going to be destroyed. It's going to be burned up. You're not going to take it with you anywhere. But that burden that God gives you, it's going to make a difference not only now, but for eternity as well. And you will take it with you. Don't blow this opportunity and chance. You guys always thought, always thought, man, if only I had the money to do this particular job, I could do some great things. Here's an opportunity you cannot pass up. <laughs> Pray for a burden. Watch what God will do. Learn it and make a plans. And just you'll grow in that. And then you'll gather people around you. And you think, I'm not a leader. Nehemiah was not a leader. He was a cupbearer. But God used him in mighty, mighty ways. I'm not a natural bone leader. It doesn't matter. Nehemiah just cared more. And God used him in a powerful way. Here's the deal. You can make a difference by yourself, but you can change the world if you inspire other people to come along with you. Um, so, with this, I close. Is Jimmy here? Okay. You guys get no music. Just hum to yourself. Okay, here we go. Define your mission clearly. Say that with me. Define my mission clearly. What is this burden that's on my heart? 
First of all, get your burden and then define it and make a simple thing. Now, make plans carefully. Ready? Make plans carefully. And the third one is this. The passion will flow and you will inspire others. The passion is going to flow through you and you will inspire others because you'll be talking about it all the time. You'll be talking about it all the time because that's that burden. Let your light shine. Burn, baby, burn. That's all I'm going to say to you. Let's pray. Let's pray. Hallelujah. And God, I pray right now, I pray that your spirit would speak to us, your people, and that God, that we would, we would get outside of ourselves and into the flow of what you want to do in the world around us. Amen. And God, that our lives would count for something greater than ourselves. Lord, we don't want our lives, to, we want it to count for something. Hallelujah. And our lives would count for your glory, God. And God, that you would take what is our misery, that you would turn it into our ministry, Lord God. Give every one of us a burden, your burden, Lord God, your burden that touches people's lives and makes a difference in this world. Some of you may say, I really do care about something outside of myself, but I want to care even more. I want to make a difference. I, I, want, I may not feel like it, but I want God to raise me up to be a changer of this world. I want to do more than make a difference. I really want to be part of a changing the world. You could do something simple around your home, around your neighborhood, but man, you can make a difference. God's calling you to make a difference in the world, church. And if that's you, would you lift your hand and just say, Lord, I just want some more fire. Just light me on fire more. If that's you, raise your hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, I thank you today for those who have a heart for something bigger than themselves. And I pray, God, that we would overcome our own self-image. Lord, that we have an image of ourselves as you see us. Lord, as world changers. We're not something small. World changers is called the spirit of God that dwells within us. And God, for those who are Christians, I pray that they would really understand that because Christ is in us, all things are possible. And God, I pray that we would have faith, not in our abilities, amen, but God, in your abilities, in your calling, in your power. And God, I pray that you would give us a heart for something outside of ourselves and that you would raise up leaders, Lord God. Hallelujah. God, leaders who would inspire leaders and who would encourage leaders and who would equip leaders, Lord God. And I thank you that even on this day, Lord, you're speaking to us clearly and specifically to each and every one of us who longs for that, oh God. Hallelujah. Raise up, change your world leaders, I pray, in this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And every one of you who've raised your hand today, I just pray just that anointing to fall upon you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name, in God's church said, Amen. 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 If you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ after listening to this message, or if you have any questions concerning our ministry here at Faith Outreach Center, we would like to hear from you. Please contact us through our website at www.faithoutreach.cc or you can call us at 574-223-7631. We would be happy to assist you in any way we can. On behalf of Faith Outreach Center, this is Roger Vogel saying, God bless.